<laughs> yeah, I just didn't save it. <laughs> okay, so your chapter starts off talking about heat exhaustion, so we'll do that next week. I'm actually going to start more with the cells and tissue and organ stuff. So I did make, or I did, I didn't make the slides, but I've adjusted them some over what we're going to talk about. But um, so the slides correspond with the textbook. So anything that's up here, you probably don't have to take notes because it's going to be in your textbook anyway. If there's extra things I'm saying that you want to take notes about, then feel free to do that. But I can also post these slides to you guys too. So if you like having those to look at as well. Plus I'm also hopefully recording. So um, they'll have all kinds of opportunities. So don't feel like you have to write down everything that's said on a slide. It's in your book. I'm going to put it on D2L. And you really, it's probably, you're probably better off just listening than um, writing what's on the slide. If there are little extra things that you might want to take notes on, that's fine. So really this course is about anatomy and physiology so is that on the next slide maybe oh no this thing is messed up now well usually i can just swipe though there <laughs> okay so the basics of how living things are made up and you guys probably did cell last semester or you've taken biology before. So cells are like the basic building block of everything in the human body. So this is an example just of a muscle cell and how it goes into a tissue. So individual cells are going to be grouped together. So there are different kind of cells that will group together to make different sorts of tissues. So there are different tissues that are going to group together again to make organs. So it's kind of um, just how it works with any living thing. And then organs are organized into organ systems. So an example might be a cardiac cell. So a heart muscle cell um, combines together to make cardiac muscle tissue, um, which can make an organ. Then organs are organized into organ systems. So along with the heart, you're going to have the blood vessels and everything that goes along with being able to pump blood around your body. And then organ systems make up the entire organism. So all of our organ systems, so what we're going to go over in this class, like digestion, cardio, respiratory system, all of those things form together to make a human being. Okay, so back here, so this is an example of a muscle cell. So that's what a typical muscle cell might look like anywhere in your body. So an arm, say your arm muscle here. So that, those cells will come together to make, oh sorry, this is actually doing a cardiac muscle. So this is actually a heart muscle. So that heart muscle um, is part of the heart. So there's also going to be other tissues that are involved there, but we'll talk more about what tissues might make up an organ. And then it gives the example of the heart and the blood vessels coming together to make the circulatory system. So this is actually, and then it shows the human. So this is actually our first little assignment. So I'll give you this. So this is the first, well, this and the D2L one um, that you'll fill out for this class. So basically what I just did is like your first assignment. <laughs> So it's going to ask you, life is characterized by levels of organization in the human, or in a human, levels are. So what's the first level up there? The cell, yeah. So the cell is going to be your first level. What comes next? Did somebody say it? Oh, tissue, yeah. So and then after tissue, it's? an organ and then after organ you have the organ system and then the systems combine to make your entire organism so there's the first part of that now down at the bottom it wants you to draw basically a map like that so you it doesn't have to be 
human necessarily. You could even do like a cat or a dog, just something that has all five systems. You wouldn't want to pick like a single cell organism that's only going to be a cell. So pick a cat, dog, you know, something that has all five systems in it and draw that up. So there, you already have the top part of your first assignment done. What, sorry? Oh. And this exact picture, I think, is in your textbook, too. Let me see. Yeah, this exact one is here in your textbook, too, okay? It's on page uh, 456. Did you get it? Yep. All right, so why is it important to even know about structure when you're talking about how things work? So when you look at structure, so anatomy is when we're looking at structure. So the basic bits and pieces that make up our tissues and make up our bodies. So that's anatomy. And physiology is what those bits and pieces combine together to do. Um, so an example of looking at structure, so when we're looking at anatomy, it's going to give us clues as to what things do. So let's think about your teeth. So use your tongue to kind of like touch your teeth. Feel what they feel like in the back. Feel like what your front teeth feel like. So what do your front teeth feel like? Smooth. Compared to your back teeth, what are they like? If you had back teeth, what do back teeth feel like? <laughs> They're bumpy, jagged. What else? Bigger. The back teeth are definitely bigger. Yep. They're wider. They have more of like a surface area on the top. So if you think about the structure of our teeth, what if you were, you know, if you never ate anything and you weren't a human, what might you guess our front teeth are used for compared to our back teeth? Tearing things, yeah. What? Look, sometimes, yeah. But that's not our structure. That's not like our function of it, but... Um, biting, so those teeth are used for biting. Would those front teeth be useful for chewing? No, so obviously what are our back teeth probably better for? Chewing, so we can make uh, assumptions uh, what things are used for based on what they look like often, right? So why do you think our teeth are like that? Why do you think our front teeth are made for biting and our back teeth are made for chewing? It's logical. So those things are true, but when we're thinking about, you know, why things are a way they are, like why do we breathe the way we breathe or why do our teeth look the way they look, it's not just because we need air so we have lungs or we need to chew and bite things so we have teeth. It's because somewhere way far back in our ancestors, it was like an advantage for them to have teeth that were good for biting in the front and teeth that were good for chewing in the back. So evolution-wise, that's why. And then as far as our lungs go, somewhere way back in our ancestors, it was an advantage for someone to have this kind of lung structure that we have compared to other people that didn't have the same genetics. So it's the process of, exactly, and they had an advantage. So those that didn't have that advantage would have gradually kind of died out and we have evolved into what we are now. So basically, yeah. So it's Darwinism. So it's like survival of the fittest is what it is. So um, did you guys do evolution in first semester? Or it was genetics and cellular. Yeah, so <laughs> what? Evolution? Well, there is, there's parts of it up for debate. And the fact, evolution is a theory. Evolution is a theory. So it's not, it's a very well studied and, you know, it's a theory that it does. So. That brings up evolution. Evolution is dog poop. Oh. Well, what's the other? Yeah, 
So that's basically what I'm talking. That's basically what I'm talking about, though. The fact that our teeth are the way they are, or our lungs are the way they are, is a process of evolution. Like at some point, many years ago, we weren't the same as what we are now, and through the process of evolving, those that had less uh, beneficial traits died out, and we are the way we are now. And like 5,000 years from now, we could be different again. Maybe we'll breathe through our skin more than our lungs or something. Who knows, right? <laughs> it's just evolution and it is a theory you don't have to necessarily agree with it 100 percent but it is very well studied and well proven and um, but it is still a theory you're right so this is basically what i already talked about so anatomy being the study of structure so it's all the bits and pieces so it's you know what parts are coming together so what are those parts Physiology is how those parts function together or function by themselves. So it's basically just how they function, how they work. So, and then this just piece says basically how those structure and function works together is pretty much what this course is. So it's a big piece of biology. So in the book, it gives the example of this owl being the organism. So he has all the cells, and then it goes to his tissues, and then he has organs and organ systems just like we do. So what is it giving as an example there at the organ level? What is that they're showing? A bone. What do we know? What's different about his bone maybe than our bones? Yes, your book is useful, isn't it? So it's, our bones definitely don't look like that, do they? Our bones are more solid, but what would be the benefit for a bird to have bones like that? Lighter, definitely, yeah. An owl? I have, yeah. Oh, is that new? I, I haven't... A live one? Oh, yeah, no, it must be, I haven't... He wasn't there last time I was there. Oh. <laughs> That's cool. So over time, birds developed bones like that, the whole evolution piece, right? Over time, they had an advantage to having lighter bones. They were able to probably fly higher, fly longer when they weren't as heavy and weighted to the ground. So then it's also talking about uh, what this organism might have at a cellular level. Does anyone know what that cell is? Yeah, if you have your book, you know it's a nerve cell. So <laughs> even, thank you though, even down to a cell. So this is a nerve cell. So what does a nerve cell do? So what is it? So a nerve cell is sending out signals to do things to other parts of the body. So if you look at the structure of a nerve cell, why do you think it's shaped the way it is? Not all cells are shaped like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's better able to reach out and reach more air or reach more tissues and other cells around it, isn't it? So even right down to the very cell level, structure and function can be noticed and and interesting, if you like biology. <laughs> um, so the cell is being the basic unit of all living organisms, so we already talked about that. Um, so in almost all animals, and humans are included, um, cells are grouped into tissue. So tissue will be the first thing we kind of talk about. Um, and there are four main categories of tissue. So we'll kind of talk about what each category is. And then these four things will make up most, um, or they'll make up all, really, or, uh, organs in our body. So different combinations of them, different layers or whatever. But these are the tissues that will make up organs in animals. So we have epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. So it's kind of interesting that something as complicated as a human here taking biology is only made up of these four kind of tissues. So that's kind of cool. Okay, so epithelial tissue, which is that first, uh, that first type. So it's what's going to cover um, organs or the body. So skin, 
skin, for example, is a type of epithelial tissue that is covering the surface of your body. So there's also coverings for organs. So what's the benefit of having a tissue that covers things? Yeah, protection for sure. Viruses, yeah, bacteria. Protection from what else do you think? Uh, cold, yeah, warmth. Yeah, it acts as an insulation, especially the other kind of tissue underneath that we'll talk about too, also acts as insulation. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Yeah, if we didn't have epithelial tissue, we would just be puddles with our bones there somewhere, but <laughs> yeah. Um, so again, the structure of epithelial will kind of illustrate what the function is. So if we think about our skin, what do we notice about our skin if we're looking at it? It's smooth. Is there anything leaking out? Generally not. If you have a cut or something, then yes, things might come out. So it's pretty waterproof, eh? So um, it's protective in that, you know, you said that, like it keeps, it protects things that's underneath and it's a waterproof barrier so it helps uh, keep your body safe from things like threats like uh, she mentioned viruses and bacteria and stuff. When we have a cut that kind of opens up that uh, opportunity for things like bacteria to get in so if you have like a wound that's infected then that was um, your skin being disrupted and being made vulnerable to that. All right so uh, in contrast, so epithelial tissues also line capillaries. So does anyone know what a capillary is? It is part of the circulatory system. So a capillary is one of the very smallest, and we'll do this more in the circulatory system, but it's one of the smallest blood vessels. So it's really permeable. So things can go through it really easily. So water can go through. Um, different things that are dissolved in our blood can go through. It's basically going to be how we get oxygen, how we get nutrients. So um, just a, that's just an example of two different structures and how it alters the function. Um, so this is just an, uh, gives like a visual of what we just talked about. So this is showing our skin and how tightly packed and layered they are on top. And then it shows our capillaries with how they're, it's just a single layer going around and it has little space in between that's good for exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide and nutrients and things. Oh, and over here it just gives examples of places where you'll find epithelial tissue. So uh, most of our organs really will have it covering it in some sense. Um, and so, like that video talked about, um, and yesterday, what did it, how much, what was the poundage it said for how much skin we shed in our, by 40 years? Was it like 45 pounds of skin cells or something? Does anybody remember? I forget. It's, it's like an incredible, now it, by the time we're 40 or so, no, we have shed, so it's continuously renewing. What? In skin? <laughs> oh yeah, just in general, yeah. Um, now it's something like 45 pounds of skin cells we've shed by the time we're like middle age. So that's how rapidly our cells are dividing. And at the end of the video, like I said, it talked about, um, you know, a, a day after we die, our skin cells are still replicating on their body. So that's how fast it's going that it takes to catch up and realize, oh wait, I don't have to do this anymore, nothing else is working but but me. Yeah, so it's pretty, they have a really high turnover rate and they divide rapidly. <clears throat> and as you probably maybe remember in your cell, like any kind of errors that happen um, can lead to cancer. So because skin cells are replicating so quickly and so often, errors can happen quite frequently, so that's why um, you know, the whole piece on wearing sunblock and not going to tanning beds and that kind of stuff because it can damage uh, your skin so easily. Okay, the next kind of tissue is connective tissue. So this has a huge range of things in our body. 
Um, so this, and it will completely vary about where you find it. So the two major functions of connective tissue are to support and join other tissues. So an example would be tendons. So our tendons join our muscles to our bones. Ligaments are more connecting our bone to other bones. So it's a little bit different in that they're a little bit stronger. But um, we'll go over what, so here's some examples. So this is connective tissue. So this is the second kind of tissue that we find in our body. First is epithelial, now it's connective. So it, it, yeah, joints are, are part of the, this, yep. So loose connective tissue. So that might be how your skin is connected to the tissue underneath your skin. Adipose tissue, so this may be what you're talking about, losing 40 pounds about. It's where, your, where fat cells are stored, so generally under the layer of skin, and so that also provides insulation for us too. So adipose tissue, that's where um, fat cells are stored. Blood actually is a connective tissue. So blood is um, a tissue. So it includes plasma, white blood cells, red blood cells. So that's actually um, a connective tissue. Fibrous connective tissues. So those are like uh, tendons. And cartilage. So cartilage would be like what's in our ears. And when we're born, the video talked about how um, our skeletons are pretty much cartilage. They're not hard bones yet. So if you touch your ear, it's flexible, um, but it's pretty tough and hard. It doesn't have blood supply either, uh, cartilage. So it can take a really long time to heal. So if you have like a knee injury that involves cartilage at the top of the bone, that can take forever or maybe even never heal, only because it doesn't have a blood supply. And bone is a connective tissue, so that's kind of like the hardest end of connective tissue is bone. So a lot of our bodies made up from that. So that's just an example of the loose connective tissue under the skin. And it, it, it kind of looks loose too, like it's not tightly packed or uh, it's not, it doesn't appear thick. Adipose tissue, so these little guys here in amongst the adipose tissue is uh, fat cells. So actually what you see around those little white blobs is the connective tissue for adipose. Blood, so it shows white blood cells. Does anyone know what white blood cells do? We'll do this more in immunology. They fight infection. Yeah, it's what our body calls to, if we have like a bacterial infection or a virus, white blood cells. Um, not Antibodies are a bit different, but... Um, white blood cells are part of the connective tissue. It tends to mean you have an infection somewhere. Yep. And then so blood is a connective tissue also includes a red blood cell and the plasma. So plasma is basically what they're all floating in. It has benefits to you, but it's not just stuff that other cells float in, but we'll talk about that <laughs> another time. Fibrous connective tissue, so like a tendon. So all of our muscles are connected to our skeleton. That's how we move. If our muscles weren't connected, they would just be falling down into our ankles or something, right? So tendons are what connect our muscles to our bones so that we can move. And cartilage, so this is at the end of a bone. That's not always at the end of the bone. Our ears are also cartilage like, we, like I mentioned. And bone, so look how tightly packed our bone connective tissue is. Oh, we're frozen. It, I believe they are, yep. Yeah. An electron scanning microscope. Yeah, it would they would be. Yep. Yeah. So this is just further explaining um, the different connective tissue. So loose connective tissue being the most widespread fibrous um, being tendons and ligaments which are stronger. Cartilage, strong but flexible, no blood vessels. So if you get your ear pierced it will probably bleed but that's because of the blood in your skin over top not because your cartilage has blood in it. 
and piercings will heal pretty slowly up there for that reason too. And bone, so being the most rigid uh, form of connective tissue. And adipose tissues, storing fat for us. Um, fat's used as energy too, so in the digestive unit we might mention that a bit more. And it insulates and cushions the body. And blood, so we can imagine the use of blood. And in the circulatory system, so we'll go more over blood. Okay, so the third part of tissue is muscle tissue. So most abundant tissue in animals. If you look at, um, you know, the models of a skeleton with muscle over top, we have huge muscles in our body and they cover most of our body. So even our face is all covered in different muscles. I've never heard that status, but... Oh, did it? I missed that part, actually. Yeah, so we have a lot of muscles in our body. Um, so made up of muscle fibers, and those are made up of cells. Uh, let's see. And it's all stimulated by nerves, so the nervous system comes into play there, too. Our muscles wouldn't work if we didn't have nerves to tell them what to do. So these are just different kinds of muscle that we're going to find in our body. So skeletal muscle. So those are what we're lifting with. That's what I'm standing here with. When we walk, we use our skeleton muscle, our skeletal muscles. And they are, um, they are voluntary. So we can move them or we cannot move them. Our brain decides that um, for us as we want. So cardiac muscle. Um, that's only found in our heart. That's the only place you're going to find that type of muscle. And it's not voluntary. Like when I'm standing here, I know I don't have to think. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, you don't have to stand there and think, okay, beat, beat, beat. And then you get distracted and die for a bit or something, right? You don't have to think that. You don't have to think about your cardiac muscle contracting. I know. Don't you hate when you forget to make your heart beat? Um, so another one that's generally... Um, involuntary is smooth muscle. So your intestines are made of smooth muscle. You also don't have to think about, okay, my food is in my small intestine now. I need to squeeze that into my large intestine. Like you don't have to think about that. It's something your body does automatically, thankfully. <clears throat> so this is just what a skeletal muscle looks like under microscope. Cardiac muscle. And smooth muscle. What's smooth muscle? Um, so like the inside of your intestine. No, that would be skeletal muscle. So anything that you can voluntarily move is generally your skeletal muscle. Smooth muscle is like in your intestine. Okay, so skeletal muscle, like we talked about, it's attached to your bones, it moves your skeleton, and it's voluntary. So you are thinking about moving your arm muscle. You are thinking about lifting your leg off the floor. Uh, cardiac muscles found only in the heart. And smooth muscles um, found in many organs and contract slowly for a long period of time. So another place that has smooth muscle might be the uterus. So that uh, will contract during childbirth so that the baby will come out. And the walls of the intestine, they contract to move the food along as it goes and it's digested. And it's also found in blood vessels. So in that video when I was talking about stress and your blood vessels contracting to make your blood pressure go up, those are smooth muscle as well. And nervous tissue, so communicating information from your brain to the rest of your body. So all those things that you are voluntarily doing, you need nervous tissue to do that. So that's the fourth kind of tissue. Um, so your brain and your spinal cord are going to be your major areas of having nervous tissue. And then you have nerve cells that are throughout the rest of your body. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to control what any of your body's doing if you didn't have nerve cells there. Um, so a nerve cell is also called a neuron. Just a little something to remember. 
So here's a nerve cell, and again, that whole structure and function. So the structure of it means that it's going to be able to reach out and send signals to other cells and things that are around it. So let me see what uh, slide I'm on here, because I want to. What time is it? What? 20 to 10. I want to give time to go over your goal, so I don't want to get too far. Let's see here. So there's not too much here left, so. Okay, so in that beginning it talked about cells being tissues and then tissues coming together to make organs. So an organ is two or more tissues packed together in some way to make a working organ. Um, so with all those tissues together it does something that the tissues by themselves aren't able to do. So the tissues that would make up your heart by themselves, cardiac muscle might not be able to do, it would still contract, but it wouldn't have a coordinated effort. It wouldn't have the epithelial tissue that's surrounding it to keep it together and protect it. Um, and it requires the blood vessels that are attached to it and whatnot. So, um, so organ is next. I think it shows the intestine. So this is an example of how different tissues will come together to make one organ. So in the inside of the small intestine, you have epithelial tissue um, covering everything. So that's your first tissue. Then you're going to have connective tissue that is right underneath the skin. So that's the loose connective tissue that we talked about underneath. The small intestine also has smooth muscles so that you don't have to think about digesting and moving your food along. It will contract and move your food along. And then again, we have more connective tissue and then more epithelial tissue on the outside of your small intestine. So all of those tissues came together to make your small intestine. So by themselves, none of them would have been able to do what the small intestine can do, but coming together, they can. So how many tissues is involved in the small intestine? How many of the four types? Yeah, there would be nervous cells there too. It's just not in this picture. Because without your brain stimulating your body to digest, it wouldn't happen. So it's just not in that picture. So then organ system. So that's the next uh, step in that diagram that you can draw on your, your little assignment there. So after organs, you have organ systems. So that's teams of organs working together um, to do some kind of function in the body. So this is an example of the skeletal system and how you have different connective tissues that are working together, like cartilage and hard bone. Here's another system. So this is kind of just setting us up, isn't it, for what we're going to learn later on circulatory system. So you have your heart and you have all of your arteries and veins connected to it. So these are different organs coming together to make the organ system. Respiratory system. So we're going to kind of do cardio and respiratory together because they're so uh, related. But um, so we have lung, trachea, nasal cavity. This guy looks so like relaxed, eh? I saw this picture. I'm like, what is that? This guy has no skin and he's just like posing like a model there. So it's just showing all the skeletal muscles <laughs> and how they are. You know, imagine if our skin were see-through, so what we would look like. And that's true. I know, right? It's very weird. He has muscles in his feet, but apparently those aren't important to the picture. But um, it's a funny picture. Digestive system, so there's lots of different organs that come together to make up uh, everything needed to digest our food. Uh, what is she eating? It looks... Hmm. 
I didn't notice that. Good catch there, yeah. There you go. We do need calcium there. And then the urinary system. So we're actually, that's part of this unit we're doing. So we're going to talk about kidneys, uh, bladder, and how urine is made and stuff. So we'll pretty much do that on Tuesday. And so that's... Your picture? Just basically that first diagram is kind of what it looks like. It doesn't have to be a human and it doesn't have... To Oops, it doesn't have to be a heart cell, but um, so for that assignment, this first diagram that I did at the very beginning, just draw a cell, draw a tissue. No, the levels of organization are just cell, tissue, organ, organ system, organism, right? So that's all I'm looking for there. And you don't have to be great at drawing. I won't laugh at you and post it on the internet. And the endocrine system, so hormones, we'll do that uh, as part of our system. So these are the organs involved there. Reproductive. Oops. Uh, skin, we're not really doing the system for skin, um, but it is part of, you know, we just reviewed connective tissue and stuff. So hair and nails are included there. Lymphatic and immune system, we'll do that one. Nervous system. And you couldn't just, they are completely interrelated too. So if we just took away our nervous system, all the other systems would pretty much be useless. Or if we took away our digestive system. So again, the systems can't work alone, just the same as the tissues can't work alone. So that is what we're going to do for now as far as that goes. I will... So that project, so I just wanted to kind of make sure everyone was clear about how to make a, a goal for your research project. So the research project involves, because you missed the <laughs> other explanations, um, picking one of these systems and picking a way that maybe you can improve it. So the example was pumpkin seeds improving memory. So that would be the nervous system and using, so if you heard somewhere that pumpkin seeds improve memory, um, for six weeks you're going to test that out. So you're going to have to develop a way to test whether it worked or not. Eat your pumpkin seeds and see if your memory improved. So that's an example. Okay. So. Uh, well, that was brought up yesterday. As long as, um, so your goal has to be specific in what you're trying to accomplish. So if your goal was, can decreasing the amount I smoke from 20 to 10 cigarettes increase my attention span? Or can it increase um, my fitness level going up and down stairs? Like if I go up and down flight of stairs 20 times, what is my heart rate, like what is my respiration, so it has to be very specific in what you're, what you are measuring. So that's kind of what we'll talk about a bit is how do you set that goal. So a broad goal would be quitting smoking or if it's some pumpkin seeds. How do you feel every day? However you're going, yeah, if you come up with a, if you come up with a scale to use consistently through six weeks, if that's appropriate for it then yes. If it were a memory thing, maybe you would find a cool memory test that you could give yourself again later or something. So you have to have some kind of way to measure it. So the goal part is due January 17th. So that's coming, that will come fast. So you kind of have to decide what system you want to do, what you want to try out. So it could be some home, just the goal. Yep, just the goal. No, that's just the goal. The whole project is due. The dates are on that paper. It's like due the end of March. January 17th. So that's on the paper I gave you yesterday, too. All of those dates are there. Okay, so what does a SMART goal mean? Does anybody recognize this from another class or something? 
So what SMART stands for? What class was it? Do you remember? The program, oh, it was the CCA program. I was because I teach that program and I've taught this there. So there we go. Okay, so no, so SMART stands for a good way to make a goal so that it's specific. So that's actually what S starts with, or S stands for is specific. So being specific about what you want to accomplish. So if you um, use who, what, where, why when you're thinking about it, that might help guide you. So instead of thinking, so a broad goal would be I want to improve my memory. That's not very specific. It's not, is it your long-term memory? Is it your short-term memory? Do you want to remember, you know, birth dates? Like what is the, what is the exact what of what you want to improve upon? So being specific, being measurable. So you have to have a way to measure it. So I want to improve my memory. Well, that doesn't really say how that's going to happen. Is it going to be over, like in a year's time you want your memory better or in five days time you would like it better or directly after you drink this smoothie that Dr. Oz suggested your memory will be better. So it has to be measurable in some way. So attainable. So do you have the resources? Do you have the tools you need? Do you have the time? So you have to think about this is something you want to accomplish in six weeks. So you don't want to have a goal of um, being able to run a marathon if you've never ran before in your life. So this is a six week period for this goal specifically. So it has to be attainable. And also if it costs a lot of money, that's probably not something you're going to want to do for your biology class. So if something costs, if Dr. Oz's smoothie costs $200, you probably don't want to do that. So it has to be attainable. It has to be relevant. So as far as this goal goes, relevant means is it doing what I'm looking for in the project? Are you working within a body system and doing something to improve something within that system? Yeah, I can. I'm going to keep adding to it because next will be your data sheet, so you might want more information on that. So I, I will put this uh, up to you. And timely, so setting reasonable time limits to check your progress in your goal. So sometimes when people make a weight loss goal, so it's New Year's, so someone might have said, I want to lose 60 pounds. Um, so making it timely would be, I want to lose 5 pounds in the next 60 days. So that is setting like kind of a reasonable time limit for a goal instead of Saying, I want to lose 60 pounds in the next three weeks um, because I have something special I have to do in three weeks. So that's not very timely, but not safely. And you'd probably pass out once you got there, right? So, um, and it's not very attainable either. So this is kind of what's made up by SMART goals. So here's an example, a broad goal. I want to improve my dry winter skin. So I picked examples that could be something you, it might get you thinking about what you might want to improve upon in a body system. So that's a broad goal, improving dry winter skin. So a SMART goal, say you heard about people taking oatmeal baths to improve dry skin. So a SMART goal will be within six weeks. So there it's measurable. My skin will have visibly less flaking skin on the arms, hands and face. So maybe you're taking pictures or something. So that would be part of your next step. Like how are you measuring it? Maybe you're going to take pictures and the sunlight of what your skin looks like, um, as well as no red and itchy patches in the same areas. And this will be accomplished through twice weekly warm colloidal oatmeal baths. So it made it very measurable. So very, so two times a week for that six weeks, this person is going to do oatmeal baths. And over the six week period, they're going to look and see if they have less um, dry skin, what, however they measure that, it could be, but they're looking for very specific things. They're going to look for the flaking skin and the red and itchy patches to have gone away. Right. So I'm just thinking if someone did this project, what is some, what is an activity they could do? I don't know. Not all bath together. We're not going to do that. <laughs> um, so here's another one. So a broad goal versus a SMART goal. So this is what I don't want to see as your goal. If you pass this in as your goal, 
then that's not going to get you full points. So I want to decrease my physical symptoms of PMS. So that is a valid, like that's part of reproductive system. So that's a system we're doing. Um, so it could be something um, it could be something you do, but you have to make it into a SMART goal. So the SMART goal would be over two menstrual cycles. So it's putting a time frame on it there. It's measurable. I will have decreased the incidence of physical premenstrual symptoms, including bloating, backache, tiredness. This will be accomplished through 15 minutes of daily relaxation yoga over approximately seven weeks or two menstrual cycles. So this person over every day is going to do 15 minutes of daily relaxing yoga and then they're going to measure. Maybe they're going to make their own checklist or like rate on daily, rate zero to ten. What, how bloated am I feeling? Am I having any back pain? Like, so they'll develop some kind of way to measure it, but this is a SMART goal. So it's specific in what they're looking for. Up here it just said physical symptoms. Down here it actually says abdominal bloating, back ache, and tiredness. So it's specific in what it's looking for. It's measurable because it's over two menstrual cycles. It's attainable. They wouldn't need a lot of money or anything to do something like this or no tools that they wouldn't be able to get a hold of. Uh, it's, it's re it re applies and it is timely, so that's a good goal. Another broad, so another example would be I want to improve my memory. So a uh, SMART goal would, could be I will improve my score in a simple recall memory test by 20% over the next six weeks through once daily consumption of 10 raw almonds that have been prepared into a milk beverage. So I came up with that goal and what I did was home remedies for improving memory and that raw almonds came up. So that could be a way that you find something like that. Um, and so as far as when you're doing your literature review, you're going to want to look into what is the literature behind what the health benefits are into almonds and that kind of thing. So. So that's a SMART goal. So I want you guys to help me. How do we make this into a SMART goal if I can figure out how to use these pens and all this stuff? So, so here's a broad goal. I want to get sick less often. So let's just make up what, what is a SMART goal going to include that this broad goal doesn't. not getting a cold. So I would get even more specific maybe what symptoms of a cold. I will have no symptoms of a runny nose. So you're very specific, that's good. Let's just say or coughing. It will decrease my writing time here. Okay, I will have no symptoms of a runny nose or coughing. Okay. Okay. I would pick just I would pick just one of those things. That way you if something were to improve you know it was specifically due to vitamin D or cod liver oil. If you do both, then you won't know which one, right? Like it's not as measurable or specific. So I will accomplish, so what do you want to pick? Vitamin D, cod liver oil. I will accomplish this through, how often are you going to take it? Through taking cod liver oil capsule daily. So I would even, I'm not sure what the dosage is generally for cod liver oil, but I would even add that. Like if I, is it milligrams? I can't even remember if it's milligrams or micrograms or whatever. So I would add that too. I would add the dose of pill because that makes it even more specific. Um, yeah, oh yeah, she said that actually didn't through taking color roll so daily in the AM. Is that what you mean when you're taking it? Okay, so how what are, what piece are we missing? I think you might have said 
said this piece, um, but there's one piece of a smart goal. Six weeks, good. So I'll have no symptoms of a runny nose or coughing for next six weeks. So that's pretty good. It's pretty specific, right? It's measurable, so it's for six weeks. Um, it's attainable, so as long as you're able to get the cod liver oil capsules or whatever, then that's probably attainable. It's not too difficult to take that once every day. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's timely in that you did for the next six weeks. So as far as making the data sheet goes, how would you maybe measure this? What do you think you would... Right, have a symptom log, that's a great idea. Maybe even take your temperature or something to go along with it, but yeah, making a log is a good idea. So as far as these slides too, actually, hopefully it'll be all on this if I did this right, okay, too. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, so develop it how you want as far as what symptoms you'll look for or whatever too, so yeah. Okay, so here's another broad goal. Um, I want to experience fewer allergies. So that, is that attainable though? I don't know. So it depends on how much you love your cat, depends on if other people love your cat. <laughs> so whether it's attainable or not getting rid of the cat, I don't know. It might be, it might be. I experience less sneezing, watery eyes. I'm starting to get messier as I go here. Watery eyes or in coughing. And irritated throat. <laughs> there we go. Do it over the next six weeks by over the next six weeks. That's a good one. I like that it's I like the dusting one because I wouldn't want someone to take something that's going to maybe give them side effects. You know what I mean? I wouldn't want you guys to take a, a medication for this that you wouldn't normally take every... I, I don't know, that it gives me that... So it would be cool... Yeah, so it would be cool to find something that is maybe like a, a different home remedy maybe that's not dangerous or something like the effects of dusting every day or like or we will vacuum my house every day or maybe if you've heard that I don't think salt lamps do this but maybe you heard that salt lamps decrease your allergy risk maybe that would be it or something I don't know what maybe I think it just puts ions in the air, like sodium ions in the air, right? Does it? Okay. So let's just do dusting then. So I'll attain this through. So how are we going to be specific in our dusting? What are we going to dust? What what are we gonna dust through dusting? All woods, all surfaces, all surfaces in apartment every two days. So 
So let's just add N vacuuming daily and vacuuming floors daily. So that could go along with it. I mean, you're doing lots of cleaning, but it would be. Right. That would be a, a good short term goal. Yeah. That would be a good short short term goal. <laughs> so this is a pretty good smart goal. Experience less sneezing, watery eyes, and irritated throat over the next six weeks. I'll attain this through dusting all surfaces in the apartment every few days and vacuuming floors daily. So that's pretty that's pretty smart. And one last one, maybe you can try this one. Uh, I want to have a few. I want to have fewer episodes of constipation. So that would be a good thing. So you'd have to be specific in like how much water. That's a big one as far as constipation goes. It is a big one. So how would you be specific about how about water intake? So I'd get even more specific, I would say, okay, there, that's good. Exactly, so she said a liter and a half, so that's good. So I will attain this through drinking 1.5 liters of water daily. A glass is generally eight ounces. Yeah, a glass, they tend to say eight ounce glasses. Um, so that's, that's specific though, the 1.5 liters. How would we make the first part of that specific? Well, you could do some kind of specific, you could do a specific diet change. You could, that could also be how it is. What about, how would, um, you can't, it's very broad to just say you will have fewer episodes of constipation. What, what else could you say that would be more specific? Okay, so still not very measurable. Yes. And then there's something called the Bristol stool chart. I know that because I'm a nurse. <laughs> and you could even, you could use that, and a CCA would know too, the Bristol stool chart. So you could even, that could be part of your data sheet. So it goes from like a number one, and it gives like a picture of little round, hard rabbit turds. Yeah, how it's made up, how it looks. So you could even measure so that's very personal. Not everybody would want to do that for something like that, but um, being able to say, um, I will have once daily bowel movements rated as a four or five on the Bristol stool chart um, over the next six by six weeks. Two to three bounce. It depends on your diet, really, and water consumption and all that good stuff, and any other medications you're on and stuff. But um, you could make it specific to you, too, right? So saying at least once daily, rated as a three or four, so you don't want diarrhea, but you don't want constipated stool um, by the six week mark. And um, you will accomplish that through 1.5 liters of water daily. Um, so that's, so as far as that being your goal, you would still have to make it more specific. Yeah, but I don't think the last minute. So colase is pretty is pretty benign. It's not going to hurt you. I don't really want you guys to take medication as part of this, though. No, that's okay. So maybe this is a great uh, one for you then, if that's, you know, try. So so maybe not water, but so maybe not water, but look up like um, like other uh, neat home remedy like. It could be something like yoga or certain abdominal stretches, like stretching that involves your abs. Yeah, look up something like that. So it could be something, and then it would actually apply to you if that's like a real life problem, right?
Isn't it true that, like, back in the day, my mother was a nurse, and she said that, like, back in the day, like, that was, like, how you had to, like, if you were taking care of an elderly person, you had to, like, show that was how you got them to go with Yeah. People use it for infants, too. Um, yeah, so you'd have to actually research how it is because um, the massage involves going in the direction of the intestines and how your body is. So that would be something you would have to research and it could be part of the literature review or whatever too. So um, yeah, infant massage too, they do it with infants. Yeah, that can have the opposite. That is not much fiber though, so it can actually have an opposite effect in the long run. But. Mm. Don't eat McDonald's every day for six weeks. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. uh, do you want the small holes, like, do you want the pipe embedded or like the whole pipe? I think there's a drop box on uh, D2L. I think we made a drop box for it. So you can type it up and submit it there. Yep. So is that pretty, does everyone feel okay with making a smart goal then? You'll be all right there. I think you'll all be fine. I'm very interested to see what you come up with as far as that goes. How much time do we have left there? 15 minutes. So if you want to take, what else? So if you can please read chapter 21 for next week, it will give you an advantage going into kidneys especially. There's a lot of little bits and pieces with how urine's made. And... If you want to finish doing this right now in the last 15 minutes and give it to me, then it will be out of your hair and done with and you won't have to think about it. Um, all of these are due by the end of the unit, so next Friday. So our, it's divided into two-week units. So this is our introductory, introductory unit, so that ends on the 13th and we'll have a test that day. Next is digestive system. So in the two weeks there, we'll have a few activities and then a test at the end. So that's how the structure is, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Pick a cell. I want you to do basically what that is. Show that a cell comes together to make a tissue, comes together to make an organ, comes together to make a system, and then the whole organism. I have two, two concerns. You have what, sorry? I have two concerns. Okay. Um, well, let me, so let me shut this off just one second.